Hello again, everyone. Bobby Sand from Vermont Law School, which, in case you don't realize, is a private, independent law school in South Royalton, Vermont. It is the only law school in the country in a town without a stoplight. We have other claims to fame, but that's one of about which we are most proud. So we feel very fortunate to be able to use the UVM facilities for this conference. Uh, but the schools, uh, while they have good uh, relationships that I hope will continue to strengthen, they are separate and independent. In thinking about introducing our next speaker, it's hard to know whether to focus on her work as a prosecutor and lawyer, her political experience and reform efforts as the elected Dane County Executive in Wisconsin, her essential national experience spearheading the federal government's response to the Flint, Michigan water crisis for President Obama, her enthusiastic embracing of all things outdoors, biking, hiking, fishing, and more, or her rave reviews as a visiting faculty member at the Vermont Law School. Suffice it to say that our next presenter does it all. I'm pleased to present Kathleen Falk. I'm still a big fan of his, even though last fall he had me climb one of your highest peaks here on the cloudiest, rainiest, coldest day possible. All that work and I had nothing to see up there. Um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I want a, spe a special thanks to Bobby and Stephanie, who I know are the backbone of a bigger group that put this conference together. It's just been marvelous. Thank you all for bringing all these wonderful people together to talk about such important and timely issues. Um, and restorative justice is this really broad topic, as we, we all know, because who doesn't want justice in every aspect of our lives, in our homes, in our communities, in our country, in the world. I'm gonna to get to that in a moment, but keep, keep your eyes on that as well. You know, this conference uh, is highlighting how restorative justice can heal and remedy many ills uh, in virtually every aspect of our lives. What a transformative and powerful tool and how important this could be to righting environmental wrongs. I've spent a good part of my life, both personally and professionally, working on issues of environmental justice. I grew up in the 1950s in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, an area that where I saw very rapidly the flight of the white middle class out to the suburbs, leaving behind the poor and people of color. I saw the sprawling suburban development that gobbled up some of the best farmland in the country. Businesses moved out, taking the jobs with them. New schools were built in the suburbs, leaving the old schools in the city to decay. Once vibrant urban neighborhoods declined. Today, Milwaukee is ranked as one of the most segregated large cities in the country, not surprisingly. So here I am, 18 years old, and as Adam Foss challenged us this morning, you're gonna stand on the sides and watch, or what are you gonna do? So like so many in this room, I had no science background, so what I did what you, what you all did. I went to law school. <laughs> I spent the next 45 years after that trying to change the world. First as an environmental lawyer, I'm making new law through lobbying and litigation. Later, as the top elected official in a county serving a half a million people in Dane County, Wisconsin, where I created new pollution prevention policies that were the first or only in the state, where I created programs to move kids and families out of poverty, whether I made reforms to the criminal justice system so that would produce less racially disparate results. But most recently, I was honored, as Bobby said, to be President Obama's appointee as the Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, serving the administration, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, and the 52 million people in the six Great Lakes states. I was sent to Flint, Michigan, when the drinking water catapulted that wonderful community to the national stage. 
My job was to connect children and families with much needed new and improved health services to ameliorate the harm from the lead in the water, a crisis which sadly continues still today. Last year, I was honored to be the Doug Costell Chair at the Vermont Law School, where I delivered the annual Costell Lecture on the topic of environmental justice. And I'll be teaching a restorative justice course there this fall. So I'm very humbled and grateful to be here today to talk with all of you experts and change makers about how we can connect restorative justice to environmental justice. Let me first very briefly describe the history of the environmental justice movement and the moral imperative to eliminate racism that drives it, and then ask the question about how restorative justice can change environmental injustice. At the outset, let me note the obvious. I'm a white woman speaking about racism. I do know quite a bit, unfortunately, about what it's like to be the only or first woman in most of the jobs in most of my life, but I don't know at all what it's like to experience racism. So I'm counting on all of you to call out my white privilege as you see it, as unintended as it will be on my part. So first, what is environmental justice? In a 2016 book entitled Environmental Communication and the Public Sphere, Robert Cox and Phaedra Pazilla pose this definition. One, recognizing and halting the disproportionate burdens imposed on the working class and people of color by environmentally harmful conditions. Two, more inclusive opportunities for those who are most affected to be heard in the decisions affecting communities. And three, a vision of environmentally healthy, economically sustainable, and culturally thriving communities. You will notice that this definition doesn't use the words environmental racism, which others define to be this. One, racial discrimination in environmental policymaking and enforcement. Two, the deliberate targeting of people of color communities for toxic waste facilities or the official sanctioning of pollutants in communities. And three, the history of excluding people of color from leadership in the environmental movement. While the word deliberate suggests purposeful intent to discriminate, others argue that environmental racism includes disparate impact, analogous to the use of that term in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which includes disparate impact as evidence of racial discrimination, regardless of intention. Others define environmental racism more broadly to capture those situations where the discrimination isn't the result of an action, but instead a failure to act, or the result of systemic or structural policies in a community, such as the widespread restrictive housing covenants of the 1950s, or home mortgage policies that redline neighborhoods, or how the criminal justice system produces racially disparate results, even if no racial animus is evident. That Cox Pazilla book traces the history of environmental injustice from the history of Native American genocide and colonization through the struggles of immigrant farm workers exposed to pesticides. In the 1960s and 70s, African American civil rights groups, churches, and environmental leaders linked civil rights to environmental problems facing urban minorities, although Cox and Pazilla note that the national environmental groups at the time, quote, largely failed to support communities of color and working class communities. This failure provoked both public criticism and the call for an emergency summit, which was held in 1991. It's often called a watershed moment in the environmental movement. Change began. The national environmental groups listened and have been working hard to incorporate environmental justice into their missions. In 1993, the Environmental Protection Agency created a National Environmental Justice Advisory Committee to gather input from the environmental justice organizations. And in 1994, President Clinton issued an executive order on environmental justice, directing every federal agency to make environmental justice a part of its mission. And while change was in the right direction, here we are 25 years after that, and people in Flint, Michigan, and in many other communities across our country and of course the world, still don't trust or don't want to drink the water out of their own water-filtered 
kitchen faucet. As I mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of working for Flint residents for the President Obama administration. Responding to this crisis was a priority for President Obama. I represented the department on the grounds there for many months, living out of a hotel, not forgetting at any moment that I was able to drink the water in the hotel at the end of the day, while residents of Flint could not enjoy that same simple right in their homes. Flint is a warm and welcoming community in the heart of Michigan, close-knit for good reasons. It's been through the best of times, and it's been through the worst of times. A half a century ago, it was a key part of the booming auto industry, with good paying jobs and a growing population. But as the auto industry declined, so did Flint. Some of you may have seen the movie Roger and Me by Michael Moore. He grew up in Flint. For those of you who have not seen it, a few salient facts will tell the story well. In 1960, Flint was the 62nd largest city in the entire nation. Today, the population of Flint is half of what it was then. Many believe that the origins of the middle class in our country began in Flint with the United Auto Workers strike sparked a sea change in the creation of labor rights. Today, many of the good paying jobs are gone and the median household income is half in Flint as it is in the rest of the state of Michigan. About 55% of the community is African American, 37% white. Flint has the highest poverty rate in the nation. More than four out of 10 residents live below the federal poverty level. And while the median household income, excuse me, household value in the rest of Michigan is over $122,000, in Flint, it is not surprisingly about one fourth of that. The hero pediatrician, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, who connected so many of the dots to expose the lead crisis, sadly noted, life expectancy in Flint is 15 years less than in a neighboring zip code. In 2011, the state of Michigan took the unusual step to intervene in the city of Flint because of this distressed city's fiscal challenges. The governor appointed a series of emergency managers, and out of that process, a decision was made in 2014 to discontinue buying the community's water from the city of Detroit out of Lake Huron, and instead for Flint residents to get their water from the Flint River, which runs right through the city. They did this to save money. It wasn't long until moms and dads began to notice the foul smell and the dirty color of the water coming out of their faucets. They noticed their children's rashes and stomach aches. They began to worry. They asked questions, only to be told by officials that the water is safe. It wasn't until medical and water scientists began to look at the data and do independent testing that a new diagnosis emerged. The people of Flint were drinking lead-contaminated water. When the city switched its water source to the Flint River, it neglected to add a chemical that helps prevent lead from leaching out of the old water pipes an inexpensive practice that many communities around the country routinely do, given the aging infrastructure nationwide. With no level of lead considered safe in drinking water, especially for children, the alarm was immediate. And so was the complete breakdown of trust between residents and government at virtually every level. Flint made the national headlines, and we all saw on television day after day week after week, month after months, truckloads of water bottles being delivered daily into Flint. Michael Moore didn't hold back when he said, quote, the people of my hometown, Flint, Michigan, are being poisoned. Let me not mince words. This is a racial crime. If it were happening in another country, we'd call it ethnic cleansing. Government declared an emergency and began to respond. President Obama made this a top priority for federal agencies, and he personally came to Flint to talk and meet with residents. Governor Snyder created a task force to review all that happened, and it succinctly concluded, quote, the Flint water crisis is a clear case of environmental injustice. It elaborated, environmental justice is not just about intent, but about process and results, fair treatment, equal protection, 
meaningful participation in neutral forums that honor human dignity, environmental injustices as often occur when parties charged with the responsibility to protect public health fail to do so, Flint residents who are majority black or African American and among the most impoverished of any metropolitan area in the United States did not enjoy the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards as that provided to other communities. Moreover, by virtue of their being subject to the emergency management, Flint residents were not provided equal access to or meaningful involvement in the government decision-making process, the report concluded. Now, Michigan is very unusual in that it had taken several steps that most states have not done to try to prevent discrimination. A draft environmental justice plan had been developed under the direction of former Governor Jennifer Granholm in 2009, and yet it didn't prevent the Flint crisis. Also very unusual, Michigan had years earlier created in its state constitution a civil rights commission, and its job was to investigate discrimination. The commission there now acknowledged, too, it should have been more proactive to respond to the crisis. It pledged to do better in the future, and it did its own investigation, concluding this. The commission believes that we have answered our initial question, was race a factor in the Flint water crisis? Our answer is an unreserved and undeniable yes. We do not base our findings on any particular event. It is based on a plethora of events and policies that so racialize the structure of public policy that it systematically produced racially disparate outcomes, adversely affecting a community primarily made up of people of color. So what now is the situation in Flint? Much has been done to ameliorate the harm from the lead, especially to children. Government at every level, private foundations, many organizations have stepped up with enormous generosity. Let me give a few examples of what HHS had done uniquely here. Medicaid eligibility was broadened so substantially that it covered virtually all pregnant women and young people under the age of 21 throughout Flint. And more importantly, these physical and mental health services follow the person even if they move away from Flint. Services were expanded to include all those wraparound services that children may need, such as extra school tutoring or nutritious food. Those with higher lead levels, uh, including, uh, excuse me, high lead level exposures now have federal and state funds covering the remediation of all lead hazards, including lead paint from inside houses and lead from outside in the soil where kids play. And there is, because of a collaboration of federal, local, and state governments, a new and unprecedented registry for, that will track and support victims who've been exposed to the lead for many years. A number of officials have been criminally indicted for their roles in this tragedy. Federal judges have ruled on behalf of lawsuits brought by the citizens, setting some remedies and some deadlines. The data shows lead levels continue to decrease and water quality continues to improve, although EPA advises residents to continue to use water filters on their faucets. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been now allocated by the federal and state government to respond to the key demand by residents for justice, replace all the water pipes. This is scheduled to be done by the end of 2019, and that work goes on as we speak. When I spoke with Flint Mayor Karen Weaver in April, she noticed that while the pipe replacement is ahead of schedule, nine new parks are being built, and another 30 million has been committed by partners to help restore the Flint River, there was a real step back in her view with the governor's decision then to discontinue providing bottled water to residents until the pipes are replaced. But Flint is not alone. The level of lead is high in many communities across the country. An analysis by the Natural Resources Defense Council concluded that in 2015 alone, over 18 million Americans drank water from over 5,000 community water systems that violated the lead standard in some manner. So the question here for all of us, what does restorative justice look like for Flint or any of these thousands of communities 
across the country. Replacing the lead pipes, surely. But how could a restorative justice restore the community's trust in government? And if there is no direct ability to undo the harm to children from high lead levels, what would restorative justice look like to a child or to a mom and dad of that child? Recall that Michigan Civil Rights Commission I mentioned earlier? It didn't stop after concluding Flint is a case of environmental racism. It went on and said, quote, having answered our initial question, we now ask but leave unanswered another. If, without racist intent, a systematic problem repeatedly produces different results based on people's skin color, how long does it take before leaving the system in place is itself racism? What does restorative justice look like to a whole community hurt by a system that produced racially disparate outcomes? These questions are the moral imperatives that rise not only in Flint, but on issues of environmental injustice across the world. Zoning laws and housing policies, air pollution and, and causing asthma in central cities, pesticide exposures to farm workers, the siting of toxic waste dumps and other public infrastructure, all extraction of minerals, all disparately affecting people of color across the planet. Indeed, this is a very heavy lift. Are we up for it? Generations of oppression is understandably why people may feel powerless to take on these challenges. I know from my lifelong work, I know from your lifelong work, to change big and powerful institutions that if people feel hopeless, then they can't get up and do what you gotta do. But there are signs of hope. Let me go back to Flint for a moment again. As bad as the crisis has been there, the pride and spirit of Flint remain strong. This beautiful chandelier, pictured on the screen behind me, the children of Flint made that out of recycled water bottles. It was sent to me by Dr. Mona. And in her words, despite this tragedy, I want to remind you that our Flint kids are more than resilient. They are exemplary and they are leading the way forward. If she and Mayor Weaver can be helpful for Flint, so can we. Can we be hopeful for our country? Mass school shootings, police shootings, hate crimes, uncertain future for dreamers, pipelines across Native American land. These are just some of the reasons people are galvanized and taking action. More people than ever are running for public office. Great new young leaders are rising up to lead. I saw it in the students I taught at the Vermont Law School. But last summer, I'll mention just one of these great new young leaders. I had the honor of meeting Reverend Lennox Yearwood, Jr. He's the president of the Hip Hop Caucus, and he's a national climate change leader. Rolling Stone named him one of the country's new green heroes. And the Huffington Post ranked him as in the top 10 change makers in the green movement. I met him when he came to Wisconsin to educate us there last summer. When I asked him what called him to work on the climate change mission, he told me he grew up in New Orleans and Cretino was that aha moment for him. All the suffering inflicted on people of color by the flooding and the obvious need for changes in environmental policy. So now he travels the country, empowering people, inspiring people, giving them hope. Is there hope for our world? Many international organizations are organizing those most oppressed to work together in common purpose, bringing understanding, new listening tools to help people heal from oppression, to build alliances, to work together. As one group put it, the environmental crisis cannot be resolved without ending racism, genocide towards indigenous people, classism, sexism, the impact of environmental destruction and climate change falls most heavily on people targeted by those particular oppressions. 
Oppression divides people from others who have the same interest and sets everyone against one another. It interferes with the united response to the environmental crisis. So perhaps our common purpose in working to change big systems, which you all do every single day, or working on compelling global issues like climate change, can help break down those systematic, those structural origins of environmental injustice and be one more way of providing some restorative justice. It is not a coincidence today that all the speakers are ending by invoking Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Because if anybody had reason not to be hopeful, it was that man. And he, yet he said we must accept finite disappointment but never give up infinite hope. We won't. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Is Senator Leahy here? Okay, we got questions and comments and good, good thoughts until Senator Leahy walks in that door. Thank you, Kathleen. Any questions? Any answers? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. First off, thank you for what you've done so far with Flint. Um, my, my question is, how do we um, complete the work because the water still isn't clean in Flint? Mm -hmm. And I think about Puerto Rico and, you know, that there's still not electricity in so much of the country, you know, months and months and months later. How do we make the accountability until the right is completed? Great and, great and ageless question. And how I would answer that is how we've always done it. You work on big systems levels, and that's why many of you in this room do that, including Senator Leahy, who will be talking to us in just a moment about what he's doing on big system levels. And you do the Band-Aids every single day because the person in front of you is hurting. And you got to do both at the same time. And that's why it takes everybody in the room, because some of us are better at doing that one than that one. They both got to get done. Back, way back in the room there, can you just shout out? Yeah, I'll get it down here, just a minute. Would you care to comment about the EPA now? <laughs> Need we say more? Um, <laughs> so so let, let me not be so, so flip. And for, for, for two things. One, um, and let me also help respond to the, the other question that was so thoughtful, which is in Flint, for example, the programs that President Obama wanted us to design were purposely to be able to transcend whatever election was going to happen in 2016. Didn't, we didn't know what the results would be. So the, the design was purposeful in creating programs that wouldn't just end after a year fiscal year. Um, and that, that same ability for government not to change instantly also means that the underlying federal water pollution control laws don't change instantly and aren't being instantly um, abandoned for, for the most part on, on these systems. Where the rubber will hit the road over the next year or so is whether funding levels you know, continue to do the kinds of public infrastructure replacement that needs to be done nationwide. Um, and that is, that's something we all have something to say about at the ballot box.
Can anything be done when environmental racism is carried out by the federal government, specifically the military? Yeah, uh, the point she's making is a really good one because um, like all of us, we, we, we usually self-protect self um, the interests closest to us. So sometimes the federal government is the worst offender. Um, and military uh, bases are notorious for having high levels of toxic waste and not, not doing a lot about it. So again, thanks, you know, you need to use your democratic representatives to democratically elected representatives to try to, <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. your, your point is accurate. Hello, thank you so much for speaking. I'm back here. I know you're looking around. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, my question is more, um, and I know that you mentioned that um, there were committees that were in place so that way things like this wouldn't happen and it still did. Um, and I'm from Rhode Island where um, around a thousand children are still being lead poisoned today specifically due to soil and paint based in homes. And I'm curious, what kind of work is being done in regards to implementation because the laws are there, um, but it's not being implemented specifically in communities of color and therefore that's why we still have this environmental racism because in these urban populations, although the laws exist, they're not being implemented. Uh, again, so, so well put and part of why we need the advocates like you are in this room um, that will take on causes where people don't have the kind of representation uh, that other places of white privilege have. Um, and uh, empowering, you know, I, I had the honor to meet just one example of these great new young hero leaders that I described to you. Um, they are training the next generation. Um, my, we, we've seen here with the whole response to gun violence and young people uh, picking up and having learned from uh, their predecessors how you change the world. Uh, I'll just close because I know Senator Leahy is walking in as we speak. Um, but as I close with, with this story, um, my my 16 year old niece uh, called me to the carpet a few months ago and and laid out the ills of the world in a description for what her generation faces and after she finished I said are you quite through now yes well then Missy let me tell you what I faced when I was your age so you have a choice right now who are you going to be and what difference are you going to make? I'm proud to say she led the gun violence for her high school protest. But that's the choice we all have each day to make and our generation before us and my generation and the next ones after have to make that same decision every single day when they get up. And that's a wonderful handover to Senator Leahy who's given how many years of getting up every day for this state? <laughs> the longest serving senator. Thank you for your lifelong service.